Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us for our interactive webinar about managing sickness absence. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Rachel Parkin, and I'm a partner in the education team specialising in employment law. And I'm delighted to be joined today by my colleagues, Oliver Daniels, another employment partner in the team, and Heather Stickland, a senior associate. I should also mention Tom and Amy as well, who are with us today, helping behind the scenes with all the uh, technical side of things. So we know who to blame if the uh, breakout rooms and everything else later on go wrong. Next slide, please, Tom. So in terms of today's session, um, after a short introduction from me, I'm going to pass you over to Oliver, who's going to talk to you about short term absences. We'll then go into some breakout rooms to discuss a case study about managing short term absence. So um, hopefully that, that will all work OK. Heather is then going to consider long term absence and then we'll go back into some breakout rooms to talk about a further case study before coming back together at the end. Uh, just to let you know that whilst the main session is being recorded, we will not be recording any of the breakout sessions. So hopefully everyone will be happy to participate in the discussions and share thoughts and ideas. Please do ask questions as we go along via the, I think it's the chat function um, at the bottom of your screen. I don't think there's a QA and a one um, today. So there's a chat function. So do ask questions as we go along. We might try and pick some up as we move through the presentation um, and the case studies. But if we aren't able to, uh, to pick them up as we go along, we might have, we hopefully will have some time at the end to discuss as many as we can. Any we don't get to today, we will, of course, do our best to come back to you after the webinar. Uh, next slide, please, Tom. So just to set the scene a little before we, we begin, I've included some recent statistics on the first slide. Um, in particular, you'll see that approximately 118.6 million working days are lost each year due to sickness absence. Um, it probably doesn't surprise you. Although the, um, the UK sickness absence, actually the rate fell in 2020 to 1.8%, which was apparently the lowest recorded level since 1995. Now, I think this is most likely uh, due to the pandemic, obviously the use of furlough and indeed flexible working. So people being able to work from home, even when feeling a little bit under the weather. Next slide, please, Tom. So before we look in more depth at uh, short term and long term absence, it is useful to consider some of the more strategic steps you can take as a school to manage absence issues more generally. Many of the day to day queries we receive, as I'm sure you know, are from, from clients relating to sickness absence. So it is a hot topic at all times and obviously particularly over the last uh, 18 months or so with COVID. Um, it is useful to remember that just because someone is unwell, and genuinely unwell doesn't mean you can't manage their attendance and ultimately if reasonable and if you've gone through a fair process dismiss them. I would uh, encourage you to have a think after this session um, as to what sort of culture exists in your school when it comes to sickness absence. Is it a culture that perhaps promotes good attendance or is it a culture um, of absence in which staff perhaps feel entitled to take sick leave in much the same way as holiday? Um, and particularly given the, the generous sick pay provisions um, in, in schools. If it is the latter, you'll see on the slide some of the, the key strategic steps you can take and you can think about to foster a, a culture of good attendance. We see policies and procedures, I'm sure you've all got those in place. Um, as a minimum, of course, now section one of the Employment Rights Act Act requires employers to provide particulars of any terms and conditions relating to incapacity for work due to sickness, um, including any provision for sick pay in either a section one statement or indeed the contract, um, or the statement can refer to another document, so a staff handbook, which is obviously um, more typical. Having that effective policy in place, um, and obviously the training on that policy as well, will help you deal with absences consistently, effectively, as well as putting employees on notice as to the standards of, um, of attendance that you as a school uh, expect from, from them. And this in turn, of course, will help reduce your legal risk. So, for example, clear and, and consistent policy on the notification um, and certification requirements of absence, um, and of course, as I said, good training for managers on implementing that policy can have a significant impact on absence levels. 
obviously it's good to regularly review policies and procedures and and really looking at them not just from a sort of legal perspective but also from a practical perspective are they actually working for you in in that sort of fight against unnecessary uh, absence issues return to work interviews equally a structured um, and consistent approach to to the return to work interviews can be a really effective means of, of deterring staff from taking too much time off whilst i know they can be a bit of an administrative burden at times conducting them as a matter of course in all cases of absence has actually been found to be one of the most effective means of reducing absences and of course, monitoring absence policies and procedures are, of course, just the starting point. And in order to give yourself the best possible chance of identifying problems and patterns of absence at a really early stage, um, then you do need to have a clear system in place for recording and analysing that absence data. It is useful um, as a school to sort of have a, a bigger picture, so a, a, an accurate picture of the, of the levels of absence and the patterns of sickness absence across the school. So perhaps in different departments, there may be more sickness absence at one time than others. And of course, any patterns or problems, um, potential problems can be identified at a really early stage. Um, and obviously then the applicable uh, procedures applied consistently. It is actually particularly important when it comes to monitoring absence for uh, short term absences, because it might not immediately be clear uh, that there is an issue. And on that note, I'm going to hand you over to Oliver, who's going to talk to you a bit more about short term absence. Thanks, Rachel, and good morning, everyone. So as Rachel said, we're going to begin this morning by looking specifically at managing instances of persistent short term absence. And I think it's fair to say that short term intermittent absences can often be more disruptive, often diff more difficult to manage in comparison to cases of long term absence. And in particular, it can be really difficult to actually identify firstly that there's a problem and also to predict with any certainty if and when an individual's attendance is going to improve. So over the course of the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to look at some of the tools and procedures that you have available to you to manage short term absence and some of the problem areas that you might commonly encounter. And then, as Rachel said, we'll finish this section with a short case study on a typical instance of short term absence. So next slide, please, Tom. OK, so looking at some of the tools you have available to you in addressing short term absence. As I said, the first hurdle with short term absence is often actually identifying that there's a problem in the first place. And Rachel has alluded to the fact that key to that is ensuring that you have clearly defined and consistent practices in place for recording absence. But of course, the recording of absence data alone isn't enough. You need to make sure that that data is regularly reviewed and analysed so that you can identify any discernible patterns of absence or attendance levels that give rise to concern, whether that be across a particular department within your school or a particular individual. So do check that your policies are clear in relation to how absence should be reported and to whom and that the data is recorded effectively. And make sure those of you within the school responsible for HR are scheduling to regularly review that data so that you're clear on any absence issues that might uh, be problematic within the school. It's also important, I think, to take a proactive rather than reactive approach to managing absence levels generally within your schools. The idea being that you're looking to prevent issues of short term absence from becoming problematic or excessively disruptive for the school. So do make effective and consistent use of return to work interviews. As Rachel mentioned earlier, those are a really useful way of identifying potential issues at an early stage, managing staff expectations in terms of the required levels of attendance and also looking to put some support in place if it's appropriate or necessary, depending on the nature of the individual's absence. But of course, those preventative steps, no matter how well applied, uh, 
don't always work. And you will, I'm sure, have come across circumstances within your schools where intermittent absences become a problem. In those circumstances, it's unlikely that your first step is going to be jumping straight to a formal process. In the first instance, you'd normally look to take some informal steps to investigate and manage the issue, making the member of staff aware of your concerns and offering support where that's appropriate uh, in the circumstances. And those informal steps are really important, particularly in terms of addressing whether there might be some underlying cause or reason for the absence that needs further investigation. So it may be that the absences are linked, indicating that there is some underlying condition, possibly a disability that is impacting on the employee's ability to uh, attend work. Alternatively, it may be that there are non-medical causes for the absence, for example, stress at work or personal issues. So it's really important that you investigate any possible underlying causes with the employee at that early stage where there is an initial concern around an individual's levels of absence. To give an example, it might be that high rates of absence are found to relate to perhaps a stress issue resulting from high workloads or issues within the workplace, perhaps a breakdown in relations with a line manager or another colleague within the school. In that case, you might look to take steps to manage that stress or relationship issue rather than focusing on the employee's absence directly. Alternatively, it might be that your initial investigations and informal discussions with the employee raise some concerns around how genuine the absences are, in which case there may be a conduct issue to address. Um, so it really does depend on the particular circumstances and that will impact on the sort of process that you follow ultimately in dealing with the uh, absence concern. In any case, even at those informal stages, it's really important to keep a clear paper trail of the process that you follow and any meetings you have with the employee. So as a school, you can track the problem and you can record the employee's explanation for their absences. That will become important if those informal steps don't ultimately have the desired effect and there's a need to progress on a more formal basis. Okay, next slide, please, Tom. Of course, many absence issues can be dealt with in that informal way. And often just by having those initial conversations with the employee, as much as those conversations can be uh, difficult and, and uh, line managers may be reluctant to have them, they can be a really useful way of actually nipping um, initial issues in the bud and preventing ongoing and more disruptive short-term intermittent absences. However, it's important that you are proactive in dealing with matters formally where absence levels cause an unacceptable level of disruption for the school. And you may well have policies and procedures in place that provide some guidelines or trigger points as to where that may apply. So if despite those informal steps, an employee's attendance fails to improve, procedurally, again, the first step would normally be to carry out some further investigation. So that's going to involve reviewing the absence data. What's the level of absence? How does that contrast with the individual's peers across the school, averages across um, the school generally? What are the reasons for the absence? Are they uh, varied? Are they linked in any way? And is there any evidence of there being an underlying cause? And finally, and, and perhaps most importantly, what's the impact on the school? and the individual's colleagues in terms of the uh, rate of absence. Okay, next slide, please. So once you've carried out that initial investigation, you've gathered that relevant information, and you're satisfied that there is that need to progress on a more formal basis, the next step is, of course, going to be inviting the employee in for a formal meeting to discuss the concern around their absence. And of course, it's important in doing that, that you're clear with the employee uh, 
as to the basis of your concerns and the purpose and possible consequences of the meeting. And the employee would have the right to be accompanied at that meeting by a colleague or trade union representative. Now, the idea here, much in a, a similar way to perhaps a conduct issue and particularly a performance issue, the employee with you having already been through informal steps to look to manage an initial concern, shouldn't necessarily be surprised about the fact that you're now progressing to a formal process. It should be, as part of that informal process, clear to the employee that if their absence levels don't improve, there is a risk that you will move, have to move forward with that formal stage. In terms of the formal meeting itself, it's important at that meeting to explore with the employee the effect that the pattern of absences have, the likelihood of those absences continuing, whether there are any adjustments or changes you might be able to make to the employee's uh, job or duties that might assist in improving their attendance, exploring again with the employee where them, whether there might be any underlying cause or disability, and if so, whether there are any reasonable adjustments that need to be made and also whether it's appropriate to give the employee possibly a formal warning at this stage that their attendance levels need to improve. And we'll come on to that, uh, the considerations around that in a bit more detail shortly. Next slide, please, Tom. Before making any decision on a formal basis, you'll need to give some thought as to whether medical advice is required. Uh, either by way of occupational health or from the employee's GP. And that's not always obvious in cases of short-term intermittent absences. It may be that there's no apparent underlying health condition that's causing the absences. And in that case, a medical expert may not be able to add a great deal in terms of predicting when an employee is likely to show any improvement in attendance. So for that reason, the role of medical evidence when you're dealing with short term absence is really likely to differ depending on the nature of the absence and the reasons for it. And the Employment Appeal Tribunal in the case of Lincoln versus Serial Packaging Limited have found that it is fair, um, depending on the circumstances, to dismiss an employee suffering from short term unconnected illnesses without first obtaining a medical report. And it was recognised in that case that little purpose could be served where there was clearly no underlying health condition to investigate in obtaining medical opinion. Having said that, do tread with some caution around that. There may well be cases where short term absences are apparently unconnected, but there is an underlying health condition that is causing high levels of absence. And you need to, at the very least, satisfy yourself that you've made reasonable inquiries as to whether there is an underlying condition before issuing any formal sanction to the employee. And the reason for that is you don't necessarily need to be on express notice of the fact that there may be a disability in order to potentially be liable for a claim of disability discrimination if you ought reasonably to have known in the circumstances. So it's important to have in your mind the potential red flags that may come up as part of your investigations into an absence issue as to that may indicate that there is some form of underlying condition that may benefit then from some further medical advice but it won't necessarily be appropriate in every case okay next slide please tom so just moving forward with that process once you've met with the employee on a formal basis it'll be necessary to give some thought as to whether a formal warning is appropriate. And again, this will all depend on the circumstances of the particular absence and the nature and cause of those absences. It won't always be appropriate to issue a formal warning, particularly if it's clear from the process that you've been through to date that the employee does have some underlying condition that may amount to a disability that is impacting on their levels of attendance. In that instance, you can find yourself in difficulty in issuing a formal warning because essentially it may serve no purpose. If the employee has a disability, that means naturally that their absence rates are going to be higher than others without that disability. Issuing them with a formal warning may not 
be the appropriate uh, uh, process to follow. And it may be that you're more going down the route of seeking medical advice and assessing whether reasonable adjustments can be made in order to accommodate that disability. What is important though, in terms of a process in dealing with issues of short-term absence is that the employee is firstly made aware of the required levels of attendance within the school and is given an opportunity to improve. So irrespective of whether you do put in place a formal warning, you should look to set some clear target levels of attendance to be achieved within spe specified timeframes. And ideally you'd discuss and look to agree those targets with the employee and tailor them to the particular individual and their role within the school. I think one of the main problems we do see in relation to the management of short term absences in particular is that failure to effectively monitor and follow up and review absence levels once the employee has perhaps been issued with a first warning or um, target levels have been set. And that's easily done. Um, it can be easy to just let that issue drift. So make sure you've got that clear process in place for regularly reviewing and monitoring uh, levels of absence um, to ensure that those issues can be reviewed and kept, um, kept uh, under review. It can be helpful to have a policy in place that provides guidelines in terms of what those review periods might be, but don't follow that blindly. Um, look to agree and adopt targets and periods of review that are tailored to the circumstances, the school's requirements and the individual's absence. Okay, next slide, please. So far, that's all premised on the assumption that the employee's absences are genuine. And clearly a very different approach would be required in the event there's evidence that brings into question the employee's ill health. Of course, if you can demonstrate that an employee has dishonestly taken sick leave, that would usually amount to an issue of misconduct, which would be dealt with in a different way in accordance with your disciplinary procedures. I think what's important, however, is not jumping to conclusions. Clearly, if an employee is seen at the pub whilst off with flu, that's likely to be strong evidence that their absence isn't entirely genuine, but it often won't always be that straightforward. There's no legal requirement that a worker who signed off with sick, uh, off sick must stay at home. And in many cases, we often find that, um, particularly involving absences relating to um, stress-related illnesses or depression, it might actually be medically advisable for the worker to undertake certain activities that help to promote their return to good health. So if you do have concerns as to whether the employee is genuinely unwell, it's important that those are properly investigated. And unless it's clear cut, we'd normally be advising schools to go down the route of seeking medical advice in those circumstances to look to try and clarify the situation. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, finally, in respect of short-term absence and just returning to cases of genuine ill health, let's say you have an employee who's been given multiple warnings but has failed to meet the required levels of attendance. What factors are gonna be relevant when you reach the point of potentially considering a dismissal? It's important, of course, to take into account all the surrounding circumstances, the nature of the ill health, the likelihood of it recurring, and in particular, the impact on the school and the individual's colleagues. I think the important thing to remember about any possible ill health dismissal is that whilst you need to be conscious of taking a consistent approach, each case will be different. Each employee's reasons for and patterns of absence will vary. And there are, of course, increased risks in certain circumstances. So if there is an underlying condition that's likely to amount to a disability that's impacting on the employee's ability to meet your required levels of attendance, then you need to make sure that you've considered reasonable adjustments. And it's likely that medical advice would be necessary in those uh, cases. And we'll look at both of those points in a bit more detail later when we come to long-term absence. 
but essentially you would be taking a different approach in those uh, in those cases and blindly following your absence management process in relation to a disabled employee is likely to get you into difficulties in terms of possible disability discrimination claims. It's also worth highlighting that employees are protected from unfavorable treatment as a result of pregnancy related illnesses. So disciplining a pregnant employee for pregnancy related illnesses would be uh, unlawful pregnancy and maternity discrimination. So it's really important that you, your approach is um, uh, related to the nature of the absence, the reasons for the absence and the uh, individual's particular circumstances. But always in the background, your, your key driver is the impact on the school and the employee's colleagues. So you may have trigger points. You, you may have um, your sickness absence policy, which provides some guidance, but don't follow it blindly. Consider that alongside the employee's particular circumstances before any final decision is made. Just before I hand over to Heather, a few top tips for managing short term absence. Um, I think first and foremost, it's about create, creating a culture within your school that promotes good levels of attendance. Um, I think taking a supportive and sympathetic approach is generally a good idea, is something that works well in terms of uh, how an employment tribunal would see the situation in, in the event that you um, uh, have to deal with uh, potentially a dismissal relating to short term absences, but there's some key tips there on the slide training line managers and often issues arise because line managers within the school don't necessarily understand your policies and procedures and it's it really important that they do understand what the expectations are and what process they need to go through when they're managing absence issues monitoring and re reviewing your absence data uh, we've seen is really important so that you can identify issues that may be there having those clear policies and procedures. We've talked about using those informal steps and that came out within the breakout session that I was in. If you're, if you're identifying that there is an issue within uh, a particular department, for example, those initial steps might be informal. You might look to um, be really clear about your certification and notification requirements in terms of absence. You might look to make sure that return to work meetings are consistently applied. Investigation is going to be key when you're dealing with any individual absence issue. Is there any underlying cause, whether medical or non-medical, that might impact your process? Um, reasonable targets and an opportunity to improve. Um, you know, there's no hard and fast rules about what those reasonable targets or timescales might be, um, but it's looking at, at average levels of attendance across the school and looking to your policies and procedures to provide some guidance. Consistency, but of course, consider individual circumstances. It, it, when you're managing cases of sickness absence, it is so related to the individual circumstances, the nature and uh, circumstances of the absence. So bear that in mind. And I think being sympathetic and supportive to cases of genuine ill health will put you in good stead um, in the event that issues do become contentious and you do end up with any um, employment tribunal litigation. Okay, so that's a, a fairly swift run through of short term absence. And I'm going to hand over now to Heather, who's going to look at long term absence and uh, potential problems around dealing with that. So over to you, Heather. Thanks very much, Oliver. Um, if we could have the first slide, please, Tom. Okay, so um, this part of the session, we're going to look at the issues that arise when sickness absence becomes long term. So this is often the stage that legal advice is sought um, as long term absence is frequently interwoven with issues of disability or potential disability. So in this session, we're going to cover the process. Um, so I would just stress at this point that it's indicative only, as we always like to say. Um, so long term absence uh, are often unique circumstances and may require different approaches. So just bear that in mind um, as we go through these sessions. Um, so we'll look at uh, how to use medical evidence, the issue of disability and the connected issue of reasonable adjustments. 
we'll touch briefly on mental health um, and then we'll move out into another breakout session to discuss uh, a long-term sickness case study. So we have next slide, please, Tom. Um, so the process. So uh, as we've heard in relation to sick, uh, short term sickness absence, following a fair process is a key point to remember when dealing with long term absence. It's important to follow your sickness absence or capability procedure. So again, the key points to establish just as with the short term absences are the reasons for the absence. Um, and when or if, um, for the case of long-term absence, the employee is actually likely to return to work. So with long-term absence, investigating the reason for the absence is likely to involve obtaining medical evidence and consulting with the employee. And in terms of following your process, um, a long-term absence is likely to trigger a first formal meeting. Now, schools and other employers generally are often wary of dealing with individuals who have been off sick for a prolonged period, um, especially when the cause of their sickness isn't clear or they're awaiting uh, diagnosis. But it's really important not to allow the situation to drift until it reaches the point where the employee has been off for so long that dismissal starts to look like the only viable option. Um, if you leave it this to this stage, this can start to lead to problems under unfair dismissal and disability discrimination laws. So in a first formal meeting to discuss long term absence, you're likely to want to explore issues such as the likely date of return. Um, so that will um, include thinking about an initial medical review. Um, or a further medical review if this is not the the initial meeting um, and how the process kind of will work going forwards what the arrangements are for future contact um, and just starting to address gently the the issue of what impact the employee's absence is having on the school as well you may also want to touch on at this stage with the initial meeting whether the employee has a disability that they want to disclose to you um, and, and just sort of start to think around issues like, you know, does the employee think they can return to their job without any adjustments? Or if they're stating that they need reasonable adjustments, can those be made? And we'll look at the reasonable adjustments point a little bit more later on. Um, and importantly, it's really key to keep documentary evidence of any discussions with the employee connected to their absence. So keeping notes um, of keeping in touch calls, sick notes, notes of home visits, notes of formal meetings, they're all really key. And I think, you know, it's often the first thing that we ask for um, if we're ever involved in a kind of process or an employment tribunal claim, we want to kind of see what's happened. And the documentary evidence is what um, a tribunal will be looking at as well to make sure that a fair process has been followed. So regular contact with the employee is also key, um, although I would just flag, um, just be cautious on this point if the employee is off with work related stress and where they particularly say, I don't want to be contacted by the school, I'm finding it far too stressful. Um, at this stage, I'd recommend probably seeking legal advice or medical advice from occupational health. Um, so we'll now move on and look at more detail um, at each of those particular steps in the process. So if we could have the next slide, please, Tom. Um, so medical evidence. Um, taking steps to ascertain the true medical position before deciding whether to dismiss an employee or to take action against them generally is crucial, um, in particular in relation to the fairness of any dismissal. So that will mean seeking up to date information about the nature of the illness, and the likely length of absence or prognosis. Um, sometimes the medical evidence can be ambiguous, but it's important if it is that you seek clarification. So that might be getting another opinion from somewhere else. Now, we often get asked in terms of long term sickness absence, whether it's best to ask questions of the employee's GP or whether an external referral should be made to the school's occupational health provider um, or an independent doctor. Um, 
so I would say whilst GPs often have the clearest picture of the issues that an employee is facing, it's important to remember that their obligations are to their patient and not to you as that patient's employer. So any questions that you ask of them are going to be considered and answered in light of what's in the best interests of their patient. And they're not particularly interested in what uh, inconvenience the school is suffering in relation to that absence. So given that context, we generally recommend that a school seeks to um, obtain medical evidence from an external occupational health provider. Now, obviously, we appreciate that there is a cost associated with this, but there is a significant benefit of this in that occupational health providers are trained to tailor their advice for employers and ultimately they produce their report for you. Um, now, as the slide says, um, you do get out what you put in with occupational health providers. So the questions that you ask them really are key. Uh, providing some background to the situation for the uh, occupational health provider is helpful, uh, in particular connected to the role the employee has um, and the details surrounding their absence. So it's really helpful for them to have that context. Um, for example, if, if the employee's job involves particularly kind of heavy lifting or something, or they're required to kind of, you know, uh, be on call overnight, um, all of those kind of circumstances help to pre uh, present a picture in which they um, can offer their advice and tailor their advice. So you can ask them questions in relation to the uh, does the employee have a disability? Uh, what's the likelihood of their return? Do we need to make any adjustments for them? And questions kind of along those lines. Um, it is sometimes helpful to have a report from the employee's GP or consultant or to have copies of the employee's medical records. Um, and there are occasions where occupational health will request that you do obtain medical records for them to see. This is often where, you know, the absence is significantly long term. Um, should you need to make that request, just be aware of an employee's rights under the Access to Medical Reports Act. So that sets out the procedure for obtaining medical reports from a doctor uh, who has been or is currently looking after the employee is the test. Um, so ultimately, what you need to do is seek the employee's consent to apply to their GP or a particular consultant that they're receiving treatment from for a report on their current state of health. Um, so what do you do in the scenario where the employee says, um, I don't want to cooperate, I don't want to see occupational health, I don't want you to have access to my medical records? Um, you can dismiss fairly in that circumstance based on the evidence available to you. However, I would stress that it is very much an option of last recourse um, and you would probably be in the situation where I would recommend you seeking legal advice to make sure that there aren't any other options to you at that stage. Um, another point to remember, just be mindful about um, information about an employee's health amounting to special category data. Um, under the UK uh, General Data Protection Regulations, or UK GDPR as we all know it. So obtaining a medical report will amount to processing uh, for the purposes of GDPR. Um, and the data shouldn't be processed unless there is a lawful ground, which is likely to be that it's necessary for the performance of rights and obligations connected with employment. Um, again, as it says on the slides, just make sure that you are um, keeping that data that you've got confidential and that you're not going beyond the scope of what it's necessary for you to obtain. So um, any requests for medical information should be necessary and justified and not particularly wide ranging. OK, so let's have the next slide, please, Tom. Um, so disability, we've kind of touched on it in the short term absence sessions and in the, the breakout rooms. Um, it's a key issue for long term absence. Uh, so if an employee is considered disabled under the Equality Act 2010, that triggers a number of duties on you as an employer. Um, it also brings the risk of disability discrimination claims, which we've mentioned a few times and we'll look at in more detail a little bit later. So 
a disability is generally defined as a, a physical or mental impairment which has a substantial and long-term adverse effect on the individual's ability to carry out normal day-to-day -day activities. The effect must have lasted for 12 months or be likely to last at least 12 months. Um, so in some, sometimes a disability is obvious and we can see it right from the outset, um, but in other cases, which are often the cases that we've become involved in, um, it's often necessary to obtain a medical report, an occupational health report on a particular employee to make the assessment as to whether they have a disability or not. Um, so, for example, mental health conditions can be particularly difficult to spot and they're often referred to as hidden disabilities. And even more so, it's more difficult to estimate their duration as well. Um, so deferring to the kind of medical experts on that point is often key. Um, one of the, the, the topics which is um, quite a, a matter for discussion at the moment is the menopause. Um, and we're seeing this kind of come up quite a few times as to whether that might amount to a disability or not. Um, and it's quite a, a useful scenario to look at because it can affect people in different ways. So to, to automatically say the menopause amounts to a disability isn't really possible. We would need to apply the test of does it have a substantial and long term adverse effect on their ability to carry out day to day activities? Um, and how long how long do the symptoms last? You know, generally for a lot of people, they can be short term, but for others, they will experience it through from the, the perimenopause all the way through the menopause and it can last for years. So you can see how we need to kind of tailor um, our, our thoughts and, our, and the process that we follow um, uh, to each kind of particular scenario. Um, so we have the next slide, Tom. So reasonable adjustments. So if you do have an employee who's disabled, there's a duty under the Equality Act to make reasonable adjustments. This also, just of note, applies to job applicants and your employees. So essentially where this duty arises, uh, the employer must treat the disabled person almost more favourably than others in an attempt to reduce or remove that individual's disadvantage. So when does that duty arise? Um, so it would be in scenarios where a disabled person is placed at a substantial disadvantage by a provision criterion or practice, often referred to as a PCP that you have in place. So this could be any formal or informal policies that you have, practices, arrangements or qualifications. Um, it is quite wide ranging, it's not particularly defined, so it could be things like your attendance management policies, um, you may need to make adjustments to those to account for somebody's disability. It could also uh, relate to a physical feature um, of, the, of your premises as well, um, and also be connected to failure to provide an auxiliary aid, um, so if you fail to provide something um, which provides support or assistance to a disabled person, such as a specialist piece of equipment, an adapted keyboard, text-to-speech software, um, that will get caught by the, um, the, the reasonable adjustments legislation. Um, however, it's not all bad news. Um, you're not obliged to make reasonable adjust adjustments unless you know or ought reasonably to know that the individual in question is disabled um, and likely to be placed at a substantial disadvantage because of their disability. So here we can see that kind of clear link with the need to get medical advice on whether an employee is does have a disability or not, um, in particular in relation to that test of should the employer have known, should they have reasonably known. Um, a good way to kind of get around that is to make sure that you make the referral to occupational health. So we have the next slide, please, Tom. So what is a reasonable adjustment? Um, what amounts to an adjustment that is reasonable, looking at it in a different way? Um, so some of the more extreme adjustments that I've heard of uh, through my career are having um, a mattress placed at the side of an employee's desk in case they had an epileptic fit and fell. Um, this is a more extreme example, but it was in a very large organisation. Um, 
and uh, if we kind of sort of consider about you know what is reasonable the equality and human rights commission code um sets out that you know that you may take into the following into account when determining whether an adjustment's reasonable so the extent to which the adjustment mitigates the disadvantage so if it's going to have no impact then it may not be reasonable um, how practical is it to make that adjustment what's the financial and other costs of making the adjustment um, what disruption would have it, it have caused on your activities um, and in particular, the, under, uh, the, the, the nature of the employer's activities and the size um, of, of their organisation as well. So generally, as a rule of thumb, we could say the larger the organisation, the higher the burden on the employer in terms of making reasonable adjustments. We have a next slide, Tom. So now that we've got all that background information, we can move back to that formal meeting with employees. So be that first or final. So in terms of um, arrangements for the meeting, in particular, if the employee has a disability, you may need to consider if you need to make adjustments in terms of um, the arrangements for that meeting, where you hold the meeting, do you need to have it at their home? If they're suffering with stress or anxiety, often kind of coming back into the school environment may be too much for them. Um, in this day and age as well, you know, you may want to kind of think about having the meeting um, virtually. You know, we always kind of say it's a sliding scale, start with in person and then, you know, taper down to, you know, virtual meeting telephone meeting um, and go on from there really. Um, is there a right to be accompanied? Um, yes, so this would generally arise where there's likely to be a formal warning or a dismissal as an outcome, but we would say that it's good practice generally, in particular when somebody's off with long-term health issues, I think having that support there for them is quite key for a lot of people. Um, so importantly, you would be looking at that meeting of consulting with the employee over the medical evidence. So you'd want to talk through the occupational health report, which you would have sent them in advance. Um, talk through any recommended actions that occupational health are recommending. Um, you may want to talk about uh, their fitness for work when they're likely to return. Um, is a phase return possible at all? Um, do you need to make any reasonable adjustments? Are there any that haven't kind of been suggested by occupational health, but the employee has to suggest? Um, you would also touch on as well what the what the employee's sick pay entitlement is if they're receiving contractual sick pay, just to make them aware of you know how much longer they're entitled to that, or when, or, or if that's kind of tapered down um, when they're going to hit those trigger points. Um, if the employee isn't fit for work um, and isn't looking likely to be able to return, you may want to think about options if they are available to you of ill health early retirement um, or considering whether the employee has permanent health insurance as well. Um, you consider the reasonable adjustments. Um, look at alternative employment as well. Um, so you could ask the employee for their suggestions here if it's looking that they're not able to return to their particular role. But I would approach the issue of redeployment sensitively, um, in particular, if there's going to be any suggestion that they're going to be demoted as well. So just approach that one with caution. If you do get to the scenario where a dismissal is looking likely, um, we would suggest by this point that, you know, you would have sought legal advice, but please make sure that all other options have been exhausted before you resort to a dismissal. Usually we would anticipate that you'd have had at least two meetings with the employee before moving to a dismissal. Um, and it's highly likely in the case of uh, long term absence that your reason for dismissal will be ill health and that will be your fair reason for dismissal. Okay, so we have the next slide, Tom. So I just wanted to touch on uh, very briefly the issue of mental health because a significant number of the long-term absences that we see um, relate to stress, anxiety, or depression. Um, you know, every time we kind of have a query coming in, you just anticipate straight away the sick note to say anxiety or depression at the moment. 
Um, and just to kind of think about how we can take steps to, to prevent this becoming such an issue for long term absence. Um, so early intervention really is key. Uh, training managers to look for the signs of poor mental health and importantly then how to deal and intervene with that um, really is key if you can you know as Ollie was saying nip these issues in the bud at an earlier stage it, it um, can help prevent it becoming such a long-term absence issue. Um, one thing you may want to be aware of and it links to that point that I mentioned before about mental health being an invisible disability um, is that in some cases, employees themselves aren't even aware that they may be suffering with mental health issues. Um, so look for those look for those signs and, um, you know, changes in behaviour, um, a, a particular kind of key one. Um, you do have a duty as an employer to potentially kind of be aware of a disability. Um, and again, you know, if you kind of have any concerns, it's about having those initial conversations with an employee at an early stage um, and approaching the, the issue sensitively, obviously, um, but you may wish to consider, you know, um, a referral to, to some kind of mental health support um, or occupational health. Okay, next slide, Tom. So possible claims, the worst case scenario happens. Um, so we've touched on, mentioned a few times, disability discrimination claims. Um, so that could be a failure to make reasonable adjustments. Um, it could be a claim known as disability discrimination arising from disability. Um, it's a bit of a tacky claim, I have to say, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. Um, but this is often a claim brought when an employee is short of service for an unfair dismissal claim. So they've got less than a two year service. So essentially it says that you've treated them unfavorably, probably by dismissing them because of something arising out of their disability. Um, and that treatment can't be objectively justified. So by way of an example, um, you dismiss um, an employee because she has um, three months, she's had three months six leave. Um, the employer is aware that um, the employee has multiple sclerosis and most of her sick leave is disability related. Um, the, the decision to dismiss um, isn't because of the disability itself, so it's not direct discrimination. Um, however, she's been treated unfavourably um, because of something arising in consequence of her disability. Um, so I the need to take a period of disability related sick leave. So as I said, a bit of a techie claim, um, but it is also possible to bring direct, indirect um, discrimination claims, harassment claims, victimisation claims. And we often see an enormous amount of claims thrown in where there is a disability discrimination claim. Uh, unfair dismissal. The relatively straightforward uh, claim in that sense. So we're looking at that you followed an unfair process. Um, the reason for dismissal that we'd be looking at, as I mentioned, will be ill health. Personal injury claims are a possibility. Uh, so we're looking at negligence under health and safety legislation. So this would be where you failed to exercise a reasonable care uh, to prevent personal injury. But these claims tend to be slightly on the rarer side against employers. Um, there is another form of discrimination and harassment if um, an illness has been caused or exacerbated by unlawful discrimination, uh, victimization or harassment. So this would be where personal injury results more than likely in the form of a psychiatric illness as a result of the employer's uh, actions and that injury was foreseeable to the employer. We're just going to have a quick look at um, the remaining top tips in terms of long term absence. Um, so, um, you know, we've kind of picked this up uh, throughout the, the sessions. Um, so keeping in regular contact, uh, so short term, long term absence, it's still really key. Um, although just bear in mind what's appropriate in the circumstances and the reason for the employee being absent, um, in particular if it's stress related. Um, talk through the options for returning to work uh, with the employee, using occupational health uh, and seeking medical advice, really key in relation to, to long term absence. 
be clear about your arrangements for sick pay so that the employee is aware of when their entitlement to contractual sick pay, if they have any entitlement, uh, comes to an end. Using the return to work interviews it may not be such a big thing for, um, for long term absences, um, but, you know, where we're kind of talking about absences of sort of three months or so, um, those return to work interviews um are kind of key in terms of talking through you know phase returns adjustments various kind of things like that and it's just a real trigger for for having discussions with the employee um so in the same vein developing a kind of getting back to work program um to support their return discuss ongoing adjustments where that's needed and just really kind of keep that under review it's not a um you know a scenario where the employee immediately comes back to work and that's the end of your your job you know um, we still need to kind of keep a really close eye on them to make sure that the absence doesn't reoccur um, so you may also want to consider changes to working patterns or the environment in which the employee is working um, including, you know, considering flexible working as an option now. Um, I think we're all getting more and more used to that. Um, but, it, you know, it's only something to kind of offer if it's something that you're able to. And if you do get to the dismissal stage, then dismiss fairly after a proper investigation. And most importantly, after considering all of those alternatives to dismissal that might be available, um, including ill health, early retirement, um, insurance, uh, health insurance, if you've got that, um, or alternative employment options as well. Okay, so I'll hand back to Rachel now, um, who I think is going to take us through any questions that we've had. I've seen quite a few coming in, so. Thanks, Heather. Well, I hope you found the session useful today. Um, hopefully it can give you some takeaways and some points to think about. Um, unfortunately, we are we've, we're over um, our time slot, so it's just after 11. So I think we have had some really good questions coming in. But what we'll do is we'll follow up with you all individually after the session um, rather than uh, leave you hanging on now because I think uh, everybody probably has have places to go so um, we will wrap up now um, from all of us here at HCR thank you very much for your engagement and involvement today I know my breakout room had um, lots of really interesting stories to share and some um, yeah some, some really good engagement so thank you very much for that and um, we will be at the ISBA conference next week. So please do come and say hello if you are uh, coming along. But uh, just want to say thanks again from Heather, Oliver and myself. And we look forward to seeing you all again soon.